Well, hello, Arbor. It is good to be with you. It is such an honor to be able to share with you. My name is Mike Howerton, and I am a Jake Goethe fan and friend, and I'm also a pastor and an author and a life coach and currently in desperate need of a haircut. Seriously, the bedhead of these last two weeks has been astounding. Uh, if this goes on much longer, I'm personally gonna bring the mullet back. I mean, are you with me? These are really strange days. Last month was just crazy. In fact, I wanna tell you, April has been the longest decade of my life. Anyway, together in this series, we are seeking to understand Jesus through the life of Peter. You know, Peter spent years traveling with Jesus and learning from Jesus and trying to model what he saw in Jesus. And so we learn all sorts of things about Jesus by taking a look at the life of Peter. And Arbor, this is where we have been for the last several weeks. You know, last week we heard Pastor Scott and he was sharing about Peter the preacher. And Pastor Scott talked about this moment where Peter was transformed from being Peter the fisherman to being Peter the fisher of men. And that was an incredible birth movement when the Holy Spirit came on that day of Pentecost and invaded the lives of the disciples. Peter preached that first sermon and 3,000 trusted Jesus that day. That was day one, the birth of the church. It was the people of God being filled by the Spirit of God. And this is a precarious moment in this fledgling movement. This moment is absolutely critical because in this moment, it's a moment when movement tend to lose their luster. It's, it's a moment when movements tend to run out of steam because often after the initial hype of something is over, it gets revealed that there's not much substance. It's sort of like being a roadie for a one-hit wonder band. You're like, what is that it? Is this song all we've got? By the way, I don't know if you've ever tried to start a movement on your own, but it is hecka hard. And yet I want you to know that heaven itself is behind this movement. The Spirit of God himself is behind this, pouring his power out and his love out on his people, motivating them. And the book of Acts gives us a picture as to what this young church looks like. In Acts chapter two, verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. You see, they are fired up. It's inevitable to be enthusiastic when you're filled with the Holy Spirit because that's actually what it means. In the Greek, the word enthusiastic comes from two Greek words, en theos. It literally means to be in the Spirit of God. You thought it meant cheerleader-like, but no, it means to be fired up for the Lord, to be filled up by the Lord. The second thing we see from this passage, what pops at us, is that they were hungry for teaching. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. They hung on every word. They ate it up like Lay's potato chips. They couldn't stop at just one. And specifically, the teaching that the apostles brought to the young church is what we call Christocentric. In other words, they, they poured over the Old Testament. That was the only Bible they had at the time. Remember, they were living the New Testament. And as they poured over it, they confirmed the reality that Jesus was not some new plan of God, but rather the fulfillment of the original covenant that God had made with his people Israel. That the promise of the Messiah found all throughout the Old Testament, starting in Genesis chapter three, is that Jesus is not an afterthought He's the foundation. And now, all of us know what it's like to be passionate for a season and then to kind of mellow out after a while. This is just how we are as humans. Our emotions ebb and flow. And we all know what it's like to go through highs in our faith and in our intimacy with the Lord. And then we go through lows where we stay faithful, maybe only out of duty or sometimes we even wander. And I want you to see that even though we fluctuate, he is steadfast. Even though our passion can vacillate, he is the one who remains constant toward us. And yet it is good for us to ask, how do we stoke our passion for the Lord? Arbor, I wanna suggest for us that the answer is togetherness. 
that we actually go through this thing together and, and, and we experience the great teaching of Arbor together and the digital fellowship that's available. I saw that last week we've got small groups that are meeting together via Zoom and sharing life and meals and, and I just want you to understand there's something about being together that ignites our passion. You know, I want you to think about coals in a campfire for a moment. You know that when the embers are close in to the source of heat, that they remain glowing and, and they are sources of heat themselves. But when they pop and kind of roll away from the fire, that they become dark and, and cold almost instantly. And friends, I want you to understand that's true for you and I in our faith. So, so in this season, it's more important than ever for us to stay connected to one another and to Jesus. And then lastly in this passage, it says that they were in awe. And this is what's important. This is where we're going. Because of all of the healing and all of the miracles that God was doing in their midst. And I want you to think about what Jesus did in his earthly ministry. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus is our great physician. I want you to understand that Jesus' ministry was preaching and teaching and healing. A third of his ministry was a part of healing. And so today, friends, what we're going to be talking about is Peter the healer. We're going to take a look at the book of Acts where Jesus worked through Peter in order to heal. And I want to start with a confession, friends, and and the confession is that this message feels very personal to me. My family is in the middle of this right now, and you might actually know this if you're connected with me on social media, that my sister Sarah is battling blood cancer right now. She's been diagnosed very early in her life, she's only in her early 40s, with multiple myeloma. And so in this journey, she's had intense amounts of chemotherapy, she's lost all her hair, her immune system is knocked down to nothing, and all during the middle of a pandemic. I want you to understand, she's not allowed to see anybody, even her family. She's had to go through a bone marrow transplant. There have been complications with blood clots and emergency transfusions. And and she's had to go through all of this in isolation. And so I just want you to understand that every day I'm praying for healing for my sister. And I know I'm not alone in the middle of a story battling for healing. Many of us are. Obviously, as a culture and society, we're in the middle of this pandemic. But friends, I'm also aware that many of our families at Arbor, many of our families in our community are wrestling with health issues. And so as we proceed with this topic of healing and and Jesus and Peter and the theology that surrounds healing, let's be aware that this is an issue that actually impacts us personally. Okay, the first thing that I want us to keep in mind is simply this, that we are representing Jesus. That you and I, if we are followers of Jesus Christ, if we have trusted in Jesus, then the Bible says that we are his ambassadors. Scripture says this, that we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. You know, it's interesting, this is what Pastor Scott talked about last week with the idea of Peter the preacher and the evangelist. The idea is God is making his appeal through us. We represent Jesus, and Jesus is a healer. And the next truth that this means is that we bring healing with us, not hurt. We bring healing with us, not harm. And this is what Peter the healer wanted to do, what all of the disciples of Jesus want to do. Let's take a look in Acts chapter three and we'll start in verse one. It says, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called Beautiful Gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. Friends, I want you to picture the scene, if you will. Here is a man who can't walk. Let's just call him Frank. 
And, and he hangs out at the temple gate every day, right at the same gate, the gate called Beautiful. And everybody knows him. They all walk in. They say, hey, what's good, Frank? And he asks the disciples for some money because like most humans, he thinks that money is the solution to everything. I want you to know, you will probably already know, money isn't the solution to everything. Money doesn't bring peace. Money doesn't bring joy. Money doesn't bring healing. And so Peter looks this man in the eye. He says, hey, look at me, look at me. He says, I don't have any money to give you and money won't fix this anyway. But Peter says, what I have, I'll give. And this is our next lesson. This is the truth from the passage we need to glean is the challenge to give what you have. Give what you have. In other words, we simply give out of the abundance of what God has given to us. See, I want you to notice that Peter he didn't start a healing ministry. He simply shared the Holy Spirit that he had received. So what I have, I impart to you. I've received blessings, so I impart blessings to you. I've received favor, so I pray favor on you. I've experienced healing from God, and so I pray healing for you. Friends, I find this so profoundly encouraging because each and every one of us can share what we have. See, I try to do this with the, the clients that I coach. I want to be salt and light in their world. I want to be wind in their sails. I want to, my presence to bring healing and encouragement to them. And so what I have, I give 100%. And it doesn't have to be in huge ways. You know, in, in these strange days, as a part of my sanity keeping, I have tried to be active every single day. And so for me, what it means is that uh, some days I'm out on the trails running, some days I'm trying to get a workout in my garage. And, and I've noticed recently, as I've been on the trails running, that, that someone has painted these little rocks and placed them at the start and the end of the trails near our home. I snapped a picture of them. And I want you to see that this has been a, just an, a small effort to bring encouragement and hope. They brighten the trails when I'm running and I'm near exhaustion, which is every single day. And, and it's just an example of what I have, I give freely. What I can do, I do joyfully. So Peter says this, what I have, I'll give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And then Peter grabs his right hand and he lifts him up. And as he does, this man's ankles are strengthened and healed. This man can walk and immediately he begins to jump up and down and to praise God and he follows them into the temple courts. He's just so ecstatic. He's clinging to Peter and of course all the people there, they all see Frank and they're used to seeing Frank down here. Now they're seeing Frank up here and, and they're going, what is going on? They know that something miraculous has taken place, right? Everybody sees this, and they're all, oh my gosh, what's happened to Frank? Frank's not his name. It's not a good Jewish name, but you understand. And now, here's what it says. It says, all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade, where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Now check this out. Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. Friends, this leads us to the next truth from this passage, and that's that you and I, we're to grab each chance we can to point people to Jesus. We're to grab every opportunity that the Lord gives us to point people right back to him. And, and Peter does this. He uses this experience with all of its clamor and all of its fame, all of the rumors that are now gonna go around about this healing, he uses it as an opportunity to preach Jesus to the people that day in the temple. And friends, I want you to understand that at the end of that sermon, the amount of folks who were believing and following Jesus, scholars estimate it's between 7,500 and 10,000. You remember just a few days earlier, the church began with 3,000 in one day. Now, a few days later, we're up to 10,000. And all of this is because God is at work. So, Arbor, let me ask you, is God still at work in the world today? The answer is absolutely yes. 
Is Jesus still on his throne today? The answer is absolutely yes. Is the Holy Spirit still at work in the lives of his followers? The answer is absolutely yes. And and so what I wanna do is I wanna spend a few moments talking about the issue of healing specifically. I want us to take a look theologically at what this is and and how it works in the world today. And, And I could just tell you dozens of stories right off the bat of of pastor friends of mine who have been involved in healings, missionary friends of mine who have been on the front line of healings, but I just wanna give you three stories that I myself have been personally involved in. These are areas where Jesus has invited me into the trenches and allowed me to see firsthand these healing experiences. So I'll just give you these three stories. The first, I was with a group of, of our elders and we prayed for a friend of mine And this friend of mine had lost her driver's license and her ability to practice law because she had uncontrolled seizures. She never knew when she was gonna have a seizure. It prevented her from driving because it could happen when she was driving. It prevented her from being in the courtroom because it could happen when she was arguing a case. It had absolutely wrecked her life. And so she came and we anointed her with oil. We laid hands on her and we prayed for her. Nine years later, she is still seizure free. She's received her driver's license back. She's been reinstated to the bar. And every day she is seizure free. She's praising Jesus for healing her. The second story is at one time I had the honor of praying with two young couples. And these were couples who were having trouble getting pregnant. And so again, a couple of elders and I, we laid hands on them, we prayed for them. And within a year, both couples had children in their home. One biologically through birth, one through adoption. And what's really funny is the family that adopted, within a year, they had a biological son, and then shortly after that, they were pregnant with twins, and after that happened, they contacted us and said, please stop praying, we're full, it's over, okay. I myself was praying for a Christian friend with a few elders. This was 11 years ago at the hospital and she was ready to go into surgery to remove a large cancerous mass in her abdomen. And after we laid hands on her and prayed for her, they immediately wheeled her out into surgery. And they used a scope to visually examine the mass. They were trying to find the edge of the mass to see where the first incision should be made and they couldn't find it. So they did this full scan on her body and the mass was actually gone. So obviously the surgery was canceled. They called it a medical miracle, although there was nothing medical about it. Friends, this was 11 years ago. I just reconnected with her last July and I asked her how her health was and she was joyful to report that she was still cancer free. And some of you who are listening to this message, you actually know the people that I'm talking about. You've been involved in their life and their story. I just want you to understand, friends, that God uses medicine, God uses science, but God is also powerful to move and to heal and to transform, to set hearts free and to make bodies whole. And so what this means, friends, is that we can't be shy to pray for people for healing. We we can't be shy to pray for folks who are hurting in Jesus' name. And sometimes healing happens instantly, and other times healing comes through a process of of work and, and investment. But the challenge that I wanna issue you is that for you and I to believe about ourselves in the first century way, that we believe uh, uh, like the first century church believed about how God works in the world. And we can't get frustrated with ourselves when our attempts to live out our faith expression inevitably end up fall, uh, flawed or, or exhibit starts and stops along the way. I just want you to understand that it's bold for us, Arbor, as a community, to as we attempt to live out our faith journey like those in the first church, first church did. It's so bold, but that's what a resurrection faith requires. That's what a faith that is built upon a resurrected Savior mandates for us. Because Jesus is a healer, we bring healing with us as well. Amen. Now, I also want to talk about the other side of miracles for a moment, because I've also seen that other side, and you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the side where God doesn't answer our prayers for healing the way we desperately hope that he would, when the prayer for healing doesn't get answered the way we want it to, and maybe a loved one dies. And I want you to hear this. This is authentic for me, that I have prayed for healing 
and the person or the people that I prayed for have not been healed. There's stories like that where the, where the person or the people I've prayed for have, have passed away. And I know that that's a part of the birth story of Arbor here. And I also know that when a prayer doesn't get answered, the way that we desperately hope for it to, when a healing that we yearn for doesn't happen, that it can be profoundly upsetting. There can be incredible grief. It can shake our faith tremendously. And I'm certain that many of us have walked that road. And so to be clear, I just wanna tell you this, that I've been in ministry for 30 years. And every one of those 30 years, I have dedicated young children to the Lord as they enter life. And I have presided over funerals as folks have exited life. I have witnessed the full spectrum of life and death. And so I, I have come to believe some things about the way God works in the world around this issue of healing. And I want to share them with you this morning. The first is this, that healing is the last word. That healing is the last word. That If you will, healing is actually the ultimate reality for us. It is the destination. You see, death is not the last word. It's just the second to last. That in Jesus, we will either experience healing in this lifetime or in the next lifetime. And the second truth is that every time healing happens, it's a work of Jesus, our healer. Every time. In other words, even if he is using doctors or psychiatrists or counselors or medicines or surgeries, natural recovery or supernatural healing, all of this healing has its source in God. No matter how healing happens, it it always violates Murphy's law, right? Healing always comes against the laws of entropy and therefore every time healing happens, Jesus gets his praise. The third thing here is that healing gives us a glimpse of heaven. Anytime healing happens, in that instance of healing, it's as if the veil is opened and we get a glimpse behind the curtain at eternity, at the glorious future we are all destined to enjoy. The fourth thing that you need to know, and I just want to set some of you off the hook, is that unanswered prayers for healing do not mean your faith is weak. That when God chooses not to answer our prayers for healing, it doesn't mean you've done something wrong. It doesn't mean you're getting punished by God. No, no, it it simply means that God, who knows all the algorithms, God who is infinite in his wisdom, has chosen to make that healing happen in eternity and not in this lifetime. And the last thought I have under the theology of healing is simply this, that for most of us, we're actually right in the middle of something. That for all of us, we are actually sheltering in place right now. We're all simply trying to survive a pandemic. We're, we're all uh, suffering a little bit financially. The future looks a little bit more uncertain for us right now than it did a few months ago. And so the theology I choose to embrace and the theology I challenge you to hold is this, hold the theology of hope for healing. Hold on to the theology of hope for healing. This is the theology of light at the end of the tunnel. Friends, this is the theology of yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's the theology of God restoring what the locust has eaten. It's a theology of give and it will be given back to you, abundantly poured out and shaken down and spilling over the floodgates of heaven stuff. You see, I want you to understand that no matter what we face, no matter what anxiety or uncertainty, no matter what pandemic or economic situation, the God we worship is bigger than any giant we battle. So please, embrace the theology of hope. That's what I do. I I embrace the theology of hope. I wash my hands and I praise, right? I embrace the theology of hope. I social distance and I praise. I embrace the theology of hope and I pray for healing and I praise. And this is what I advocate for those that I coach and I minister to and and I do this not because bad things don't happen in this world but because hope is a much more faith-filled place to inhabit. Hope is a much more encouraging place to dwell. And so regarding my sister Sarah, I just want you to know that every day I embrace the theology of hope on her behalf. 
and I choose to live in faith knowing that God can heal her and that God is healing her and that God will heal her. And every day I lift her up to the Lord and I simply rest in the love and joy of Jesus. See, I know Jesus loves my sister. She she is a way better person than I am. And I choose to trust that he knows the plans that he has for her, plans to give her a hope and a future. So let's head back to Acts. Acts chapter five now, verse 14. This is another episode about Peter. It says, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns surrounding Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. I mean, what a beautiful picture, right? And what I see in this description is how God's Holy Spirit is so powerfully working in and through and around the person of Peter. In other words, Peter is so surrendered to God's call. Peter is so filled with God's Spirit that people are elevated just by being in his presence, just by being around him. I can imagine Peter walking into the room and the atmosphere of the room just changes because Peter the healer, filled with God's spirit, walked in. See, people are encouraged, they receive hope, they experience healing just by being near this guy. And I think it's an amazing picture. And that's how Peter the healer lived and and that's how all of the followers, all the disciples of Jesus were seeking to live. They were seeking to bring that kind of life and light with them, that kind of healing and encouragement with them and, and being so filled with the aroma of grace and so filled with the Holy Spirit that people couldn't help but be impacted by that. And friends, I want you to understand, this is the truth that we've been building to our entire time together today. And it's just this, that Jesus is the ultimate healer. And he works through us in all kinds of ways to bring his healing into the world. Jesus is the ultimate healer, and he's the one working through us in all kinds of ways to bring his healing into the world. And friends, that's what I pray for when people spend time with me. It is. I spend time talking about this with the Lord and praying with the Lord about this. And I want people to be blessed and healed and elevated when they've spent time with me. That's how I want my life to be spent. Encouraging others, encouraging people in their faith journey, encouraging pastors and elders and leaders in the marketplace and those who stay at home with their children. And I wanna encourage my own family and my own wife and my own kiddos. And and I wanna encourage every single person watching online right now. I wanna contribute that. Peter made a contribution. I wanna make a contribution as well. And friends, this reminds me of a fun line from the movie Dead Poet Society. And if you've ever seen that movie, you probably remember this line. Robin Williams says that the great play goes on and you may contribute a verse. The great play goes on and you may contribute a verse. What will your verse be? You see, I want you to understand that Jesus has a verse for you to contribute. Jesus has a role for you to play. Jesus has a call on your life. And friends, using the example of Peter the healer, who was so focused on the person of Jesus the healer, so filled by the Holy Spirit of healing that he was able to bring healing and encouragement wherever he went. Friends, I wanna ask you, would you consider being that kind of person in your world today? Would you allow Jesus to work through your life to bring encouragement and to bring healing to all those around you so that he might receive all the glory and so that his church might be built in Jesus' name. Friends, why don't we pray right now and we ask God to do this in and through us so that we might be this life and light in the world. Why don't you pray with me now? Lord Jesus Christ, we wanna say thank you for the way in which you lived in this world. We wanna thank you for the way that you stewarded your ministry, that you spent your time lifting and elevating, bringing life and light, and specifically bringing healing to those who were in need of it. And Lord, thank you for the example of Peter, that that he saw this, 
and he learned from it and he wanted to model it and Holy Spirit, you filled him and allowed him to bring this kind of healing wherever it was that he went. And Jesus, it's such an encouragement to us today because we know that you are with us today. Holy Spirit, we we invite you to come and to fill us today. And we ask that you would show us how we might bring your light and your life and your healing to those that we are surrounded by, to those that we are able to impact. And Jesus, we wanna give you all the glory and all the praise. And Jesus, we ask, just like in Peter's life, that you would continue to build your church. We love you, Lord. We wanna thank you. We praise you for all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for joining us online here at Arbor. If you enjoyed watching, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on whatever social media platform you use. Maybe you're interested in joining a group, volunteering, or just wanna get to know us more. Visit our website, arborchurch.com. I hope you have a great day and thanks for watching.